What will 2022 mean for the Middle East construction sector? That's the million dirham question that's on the industry's mind. And to shed light on this topic, I'm joined by David Merritt, Managing Director and Head of Middle East and Asia Pacific at Driver Threat. Thanks very much for joining me today, David. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Let me start by asking you very bluntly, is the region doing a fair job in attracting top tier contracting talent? And if so, how could you explain the recent high profile contractor exits that we witnessed? Um, good question. I've been saying this for a while now about the exit of top tier uh, contractors from the region. And it's a loss. It's a loss of know-how. It's a, it's a loss of years of uh, experience and yeah, I'd, I'd really like to see more of them come back to the region. Um, you've seen exits of um, lots of British, European, American, Australian uh, contractors, engineers um, who who bring just years uh, 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 of know-how, knowledge um, of how to build massive infrastructure projects. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, you're seeing that void replaced by, by the local contractors emerging, which is a good thing as well. So it's not a complete downside, but to, to work with uh, and learn from the depth of talent that was here, uh, that isn't anymore. Yeah, it's a shame. So David, you may agree with me that the industry has started to procure differently. And a major step towards this change is a deeper focus on the local supply chain. Now, in other cases, developers are admittedly shifting uh, the risk and responsibility of procurement away from the contractors and are taking complete ownership of this process. Do you think that's the optimal way forward? I wish we were procuring differently. Um, I think um, COVID um, has impacted procurement in terms of there is now a necessity to utilize the local supply chain, maybe more than they were doing before. We have to put that in context that the local supply chain is still fairly limited um, in terms of uh, the raw materials and the manufacturing capabilities locally. It's improving year on year, but um, I don't know the statistics, but but I'm I'm surmising that the, the vast majority of materials used in construction are still imported. But again, if we're using local sources and using them more, that's a good thing, right. um, because from that people will make further investments uh, in in producing materials locally for construction, um, creating jobs, creating wealth, creating growth. That that's that's good. Out here, what you traditionally see is developers, uh, some of the big developers, they, they take ownership uh, of uh, a lot of the subcontracting. Contractors go into a big project and a lot of the work is, is deemed to be provisional sums, um, which uh, is, is normally under the developer's control at that point in terms of sourcing, appointing, negotiating with a, sub, a nominated subcontractor. And traditionally, that's been uh, uh, one of the big root causes of problems, claims in this area. There was one project I was involved in, an iconic project that was 80% provisional sums. So you had the developer taking uh, responsibility for procuring those subcontractors. But well, there was little involvement of the contractor uh, the main contractor in the procurement process. So they almost got dumped with the package. Here you are, these people are doing the, the lifts. So it's then for the contractor to start integrating mm. that into the project. That's the wrong way to go about it. It's, um, it, it, it's just sort of bolting on things to uh, a complex project already. So that still goes on, the, the, the nominated subcontractor. There's always a place for a nominated subcontractor because um, you know, some packages are quite specialist and need that. And, but it's the design development. This particular project that I've got in my mind was, was I'd say, probably 10, 15% designed at the outset. So the design is happening during the project. 
these specialist subcontractors are bringing their own design expertise and that's being incorporated into the project. And the design is developing as you go along. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's always changes. And this is, it's the changes that uh, give rise to claims. 100%. And now while we're still talking about uh, procurement and the ideal procurement method, I'd like to understand from you just how the PPP, public-private partnership uh, procurement model, works for the industry. Do you see the Middle East uh, construction sector taking that route more often? I, I really hope so. I think PPP is um, uh, a good alternative way to, um, to, to fund jobs. Uh, there's still a big infrastructure spend happening out here. And um, these are all massive capital expenditure projects for governments. Now, what you see out here with the reluctance of governments with PPP is they don't really want to give away assets, um, government assets, country assets, to private companies. That's a mindset. Um, it's happened... Uh, well, in other jurisdictions. Um, I'm from the UK. I was involved in the PFI for schools projects. I was involved in a couple of hospital projects that were privately funded. It was a step change for them at the time. You know, the National Health Service was always, you, you know, the, the jewel in the government's crown. But, but here you had private companies coming in and running hospitals. Um, and um, I, I think, by and large, it's been very successful. But you have to get over the, the, the kind of state ownership of things. Um, but there is a lack of what we'd call bankable projects for contractors or um, PPP contractors or joint ventures or, you know, they come together to build these things uh, to get involved with. It's improving, I think. Q8, I was involved with um, a PPP in Q8. Um, they were probably the first to try and really push this in the region. I worked with uh, a law firm there uh, who, who were at the, uh, the center of that. Um, and there's been pockets of PPP. Um, I think Saudi has some social housing. Um, Qatar has some water and power projects. Um, Kuwait has a couple of healthcare mm -hmm. projects, so it's, it's, it's very small, but that might attract the contractors, the international contractors that have left back into, if, if, if there was a framework, uh, if, there was a, if there was legislation for PPP. At, at the moment, they're still wrestling with it, but I think we're getting there. I yeah, think there definitely is a push in that regard. Mm, but what it does do for governments, it eases the need to spend yeah, huge amounts of money, capital expenditure on on infrastructure projects or, or hospital. Or um, and there's some some sectors that are just prime for PPP: power projects, energy projects, uh, healthcare projects, school projects. Yeah, they're, they're, they're just um, they're just right for well suited yeah, for yeah. a PPP model. Yeah. Now for the big and the final question, uh, I'd like to understand from you just what does the year look like for the Middle East uh, construction industry? I think it's bouncing back. Um, in my time here, the, the, the ability of this region to bounce back has always been impressive. You, the uh, financial global crisis back in 2008, 2009, you had the, um, the, the Arab Spring in 2014. 2010, 2012, I can't remember when that was now. Um, but you've seen with all the kind of major economic or world events that have impacted this region, and it's always bounced back. You always had doom mongers at the time saying the world is ending, but, but it's not. And um, I, I, Dubai will bounce back, the UAE will bounce back, and it is. Um, there's a robustness to this place that, that is quite impressive. Wonderful. Very well said. On that note, thank you, David, for taking the time to Disha. speak with me. It was wonderful having you. No, Tisha, pleasure's all mine. Thank you very much. <laughs>